Our next panel, the future of tech-enabled real estate, is composed of some of the top CEOs and founders of these companies. Did you guys know that you were the top? Um, and we are going to have, uh, as our panel moderator this, uh, this morning, the CIO of CRE Tech. He oversees all market research and intelligence initiatives for the largest media platform in commercial real estate. Please welcome to the stage all of our panelists and our moderator, Ash Zandi. Okay, Ash Zandi, sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Are we on? Good. Good morning, everybody. My name is Ash Gonzandi. I'm really excited to be here today. We have an amazing, amazing panel for you guys. Um, Year to date, we have $20 billion invested in our industry. We are at the stage of real estate tech where it's starting to actually rival fintech. And our industry is exploding with innovation, not just so much in software and hardware, but also built world innovation. And we're starting to see it in construction, commercial, residential, and so on and so, so, on and so forth, especially in hospitality as well. My one of my favorite segments in the industry is multifamily. And being in Atlanta, you're seeing all this innovation, mass urbanization. We're really just across the street from one of the largest multifamily developments in Atlanta. And you cannot talk about multifamily innovation without talking about all the amazing startups that are in our industry. I'm really excited to be here. We have an amazing panel to talk about the new age of tech enabled real estate. We want to kind of dive into um, our uh, uh, kind of Q&A early because I think context matters. So I really kind of want to field everyone's questions for the audience. Um, just quick show of hands. Who here is in conventional real estate? So not tech. Who's in conventional real estate? We got one, two. Don't be shy. Hi, how you doing? Um, three, great. And who here is in, is in tech? Great. Um, so software, venture, great. Cool. All right. So now we've contextualized. <laughs> so we have an amazing panel. I'll start from last to front, my uh, twin suit brother. Uh, Mark Schmuckler, the chief, uh, sorry, the CEO of Bixby. He's now the head of product at uh, Hello Alfred. Welcome. Uh, Chris Bledsoe, CEO of Ali. And Amir uh, Dukic, uh, the CEO of Rabu. God, let's kind of just quickly just dive into this. Um, we're seeing all these trends, uh, so all these amazing trends in, in multifamily, um, and, and a lot of urban, uh, macro uh, urbanization happening in, in major urban hubs. What's leading it? And I'll, I'll start with you. Yeah, so uh, I'm with Rabu, Emir Dukic. Uh, we do uh, basically automation and investment management for short-term rentals. Uh, so what we've seen quite a bit is uh, multifamily developers are starting to get into the short-term rental space. Uh, so we work with them early on during the design build phase to help them set those properties up uh, through automation so that operationally they're sound. So things like IoT devices, connected homes, things of that nature that allow us to create a, a digital footprint for hospitality by giving guests uh, and travelers uh, a consistent experience. Awesome. Chris. Hey, everyone. Uh, I'm Chris Bledsoe from Ollie. Um, for those who don't know, Ollie is a co-living operator. Um, when we talk about co-living, I think the clean cleanest way to define it is, um, and the most memorable, is to talk about the four co's of co-living. So when a consumer shows up at an Ollie building, they're getting cost savings, convenience, comfort, and community. Um, we deliver our platform through a um, really a, a complete sort of ecosystem of tech-enabled services. Uh, everything from the leasing process, which is automated, to the, um, the RSVPing to social events, um, to the management of you know, things like work orders, um, maintenance uh, requests, those, those sorts of things. Um, even there's a digital do not disturb button that we have in our app. So we're really automating the management process as well, and we're providing the service component 
on top of that, and we're putting it all under a brand called Ollie that's delivering the cost savings, convenience, comfort, and community for our consumers. I think the thing that's really driving the urbanization trend in the first place is this desire to be closer to, um, clo closer to our jobs, closer to where we can make a living, um, but also the desire to be closer to one another. Uh, yet it, it's a little bit paradoxical because in the existing multifamily space, um, you know, they can be often as dense as they are, can be quite lonely places to live. Um, you can go years without actually knowing even your neighbor's name. And so that's the dynamic um, that we're looking to change at Ollie and um, really reconnect people back to why they're urbanizing um, in the first place. Awesome. Mark? Uh, yeah, Let me hi. just reframe the question. Um, so what are some of the trends that are shaping our industry? And start with your company. Yeah, sure. Good morning, everyone. My name is Mark Smuckler. I was the co-founder and CEO at Bixby, uh, recently sold our company to Hello Alfred, where I oversee product development. Uh, at Bixby, we built uh, technology that helped empower owners and operators to provide a better resident experience. Uh, at Hello Alfred, we're building a human-powered concierge uh, platform that helps support owners and operators also in providing a better resident experience. I think what we always talk about in terms of, of uh, urbanization besides just the migration to cities that, that has continued. And it's funny how it's kind of switched over the last five to 10 years. There's kind of the suburbanization and people moving out of cities, but now more cyclically, it's kind of come back in the other direction. Uh, but we always see the trend driven kind of by two sides, both the owner operator side and the tenant resident side, uh, meaning more discerning tenants and residents, a different expectation for quality of living, different standards, and you almost, uh, Renting an apartment isn't just four walls and a bedroom and a kitchen today. And that's why you have uh, more non-traditional owners and operators like Ollie and Rabu coming to market. And at Bixby and Alfred, we always look at how do we help support traditional owners and operators uh, in providing that same kind of experience uh, that teams like Chris uh, are rethinking. Uh, but at the same time, we also see that on the owner and operator side, there's, there's finally... Um, a concerted effort to adopt technology to provide a better experience. And so you kind of have both those tailwinds, the tenants demanding more, and then a younger group uh, of owners and operators starting to come to the table who have a different relationship with technology and are able to use it to deliver a better experience. And that's kind of what we're seeing uh, from our side. I kind of want to follow up with that. We were kind of joking before outside, um, talking about the tenant experience. and and. With tenant experience, you know, uh, with owner operators, like we, we can build them amazing technology, we can connect people, we can do amazing things, but without having a direct correlation to ROI, um, you know, it, it, it's hard for owner operators, to, sorry, owner operators, to actually kind of grasp what that actually means, right? So we're gonna, we're gonna talk about connectivity, we're gonna talk about connections, meaningful connections, but what great impact are we seeing on the on the owner operator side? Like, how are we? Uh, Driving, what are the cost derivatives there? What are we doing as, as tech companies to actually increase the ROI of the asset? Are we decreasing expenses? Like, what is that? I'll start with you, Chris, because uh, you've done some amazing work there. Yeah, so Ollie's model is, and, and tying back to that first co that I mentioned, cost savings, the way that we deliver cost savings is through densification. Um, so we're densifying the asset, we're removing square footage um, uh, per occupant. And there's two ways for us to do that. One is um, shrink the size of a, stu of a studio down from, say, instead of 500 square feet down to 300 square feet. Another way for us to do that is add bedrooms into an existing, um, say, like if it was a 700 square foot one bedroom, for us, that's going to be a three bedroom. Uh, and then we use all sorts of techniques, transforming furniture and all that to make it a lot more um, comfortable and palatable and a place that's desirable for the consumer. Now, the reason why this is a little bit of a roundabout answer to Asher's question, but the reason why densification is important is not just because it delivers cost savings to the consumer, but also because it unlocks um, a real estate arbitrage. So Ollie's business model, we're monetizing um, essentially our trade with the consumer for space. So the deal is give us space back, we're gonna reallocate that to another unit that we can rent out or another bedroom that we can rent out. Um, and we're gonna give you lifestyle. But we're so efficient at eliminating space from the consumer without them missing it that we're able to generate even more revenue for a building than a conventional apartment. Um, so our most recent location, about 422 beds in um, Long Island City, 
that location in New York, in New York, um, that location has created a really great case study for what we can do for the owner of an asset economically, because the upper two thirds of that building are conventional apartments and the lower third are Ali densified units. We've unlocked about a 50% revenue per square foot arbitrage, which net of all of the costs involved in delivering on the Ali brand experience, Wi-Fi, cable, housekeeping, social events, and the list goes on, net of all of those costs is translating to over a one third improvement in the NOI. Now our model is driven mostly by unlocking this arbitrage and we've created this machine essentially in a brand to help us do that at scale. But there's also a little bit of a service margin. The fact that we're buying Wi-Fi in bulk or furniture in bulk or housekeeping in bulk allows us to um, negotiate economies of scale kind of pricing and then either pass that through to the consumer in the form of a lower price point or capture margin for our own business, or a little bit of both. Amir, I see you nodding your head. Yeah, no, I mean, uh, I agree with everything uh, Chris said. We started Rabu initially as a uh, basically operator of short-term rentals based in Charlotte, North Carolina. And what we found uh, with the uh, growth of Airbnb, hospitality-wise, uh, travelers were looking for full homes to stay in, not just in traditional vacation destinations like beaches or resorts or, or mountain, mountain cities. Uh, they were looking to do, do so in urban areas, uh, and that's how we started. We started offering single-family homes initially in, in Charlotte, North Carolina, and then started partnering multifamily developers who saw some of the upside as well. They saw travelers are looking for full service homes to stay in as opposed to in, in hotels. So uh, by, uh, t by working with these owner operators and converting uh, long term apartments uh, and long term multifamily residences into short term hospitality operations, uh, they've been able to generate a significantly higher return on their homes, uh, usually it's over 60% as opposed to what they would be able to generate off uh, traditional long term. So it's been, a, it's been a great way for them to use uh, the short term rental strategy as an investment uh, opportunity to generate more revenue off their properties. Now, do you guys focus on, on, on single family homes or is it multifamily? We do, so from our automation platform, we do both, uh, but uh, a lot of our growth recently has come with uh, multifamily, with owner operators and developers during the design build phase from the get go. Uh, more and more uh, of the forward thinking operators are starting to utilize their entire portfolio as short term rental. So we work with them from the, from the get go. That's awesome. And so, Mark, you, you, you come in from a really interesting point because you're actually servicing these assets. Like, walk us through that. What, what does that look like? Yeah, I think the conversation in terms of ROI uh, is very different from my side of things. Obviously, densifying uh, the unit, I mean, there's clear arbitrage there. For us, we always talk about operational efficiencies. Uh, the statistic we point to is if you're a property manager who can utilize a technology to better communicate with residents, more accurately uh, and efficiently capture rents, and most importantly, more efficiently process maintenance requests, which is the largest com contributor to your operating expense, uh, that's where the ROI comes from. And we often say that a property manager on a platform like Bixby can manage about 300 units versus a property manager without a product like Bixby can oversee about 100 units. And so if you're thinking about it from the property manager side of things and their business in, in growing their footprint, every new building that they win a management agreement for, they need to hire uh, a full staff um, so products like ours make their business more scalable. Yeah. On the Hello Alfred side, it's a little bit different. It probably comes in from the side of the amenities arm race. And unfortunately, it's probably a little bit less of a question of ROI and more differentiating the building, uh, providing services that other buildings in your area don't, uh, and retaining tenants. And that's probably where the ROI really comes from. Because I think the statistic is every turnover contributes to about $3,000 of operating expense. So for every like 10% that you can limit turnover, there's significant cost savings there. And what can you do to give somebody just a little bit of a better experience in the building so that they choose to stay in you versus going to another building nearby? That's a great point. I remember um, growing up in the multifamily world, the, the number one thing that ate at your income was always a vacancy. One vacancy wiped out your entire profit for that one unit that year that you always hoped that, actually re that tenant would renew. Um, so speaking about all this amazing stuff you guys are working on, you know, accessibility, you're talking about transparency, you're talking about bringing people to uh, together, densifying in, in, in a smaller space. 
what we're starting to really talk, like really talk about is you know transparency in our in our industry, both on in terms of on the tech side, but also on the living side. Walk us through, and this is not just for us. This is like a, 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 has been an emerging trend for the past five, ten years. Walk us through what that actually means. What is transparency, and why is it so important? You know, like we're so willing to like push a button. We sign up for Facebook or IG or whatever. We're so willing to give up our information and our and our privacy, but yet when it comes to living, we're a little bit more, more guarded. But when you give up more information, you get better service. Walk us through what that actually means in our industry. Amir, I'll start with you. Yeah, I mean, uh, in our space, uh, with short-term rental specifically, uh, where we've seen most of our successes, people are willing to be uh, open themselves up to new experiences in, uh, you know, non-traditional accommodation spaces. Uh, so, uh, we, anytime we work with a client, we tell them to be transparent with their with their uh, entire community to let them know, okay, this is going to be a short-term rental pro uh, uh, asset. We're going to do X, Y, and Z with it uh, so that, one, it sets the proper example for all the tenants that are already in the space and that are in the neighborhood, uh, but then also creates less friction when a tenant, uh, when a guest, uh, hospitality traveler shows up. Uh, we've seen quite a bit of Airbnb, you know, horror stories of, you know, uh, apartments uh, or residence, residences being illegally rented. Uh, on Airbnb or at least arbitraged. Uh, so we encourage our, our clients to be as transparent as possible with, with the community. I, I mean, I can think of a lot of examples where it's just gonna be um, a lot more advantageous to be transparent, whether that's with, you know, whatever your amenity build out schedule is or with whatever d information you're collecting from the consumer and what you're doing with it and how you're storing it. And, um, Transparency is a, is a plus across the board, um, but I would say there's heightened sensitivity. Um, if you think about housing as a consumer product category, and I do think of it that way, um, although that's, I know, kind of not the norm, but if you do think about housing as a consumer product category, I think it's the most intimate of consumer product categories. Um, some products, you know, are tactile and you have a, a sort of external relationship with the product, um, you know, like household, household goods maybe. Um, something like food is intimate to the next level because it's uh, something that you're ingesting, um, you know, into your body. And then I think housing, you're physically putting yourself into, um, you know, into this space and, and um, you know, this space has, you know, holds your private, most intimate moments. And so that I think as a consumer product spectrum, in terms of intimacy spectrum, I think housing is as intimate as it gets. And for that reason, transparency is um, really the uh, ultimate thing that we owe our consumer who's trusting us with that level of intimacy. You know, to, to that point, like, you see what Amazon's doing. They don't want to actually build homes. What they really want to do is deliver your packages and your, and your goods to your home and place it inside your refrigerator. You know, when we're talking about, you know, transparency, are we really talking about, like, what are we giving up? Like, you know what I mean? Like, what are we actually giving up? Like, can you walk us through, are we, do we have to compromise ourselves in order, in order to achieve the utopia? You know what I mean? Or like, what do we have to do uh, for us? Like you see it in China, right? Like in China, you give up all your rights and they're super efficient, but in Europe, complete opposite. They're so data guarded. Um, and so you're seeing less and less, pro, you know, emerging real estate tech companies in Europe because of that. And they're actually coming to the U.S. or going to China. Um, so the talent's coming here anyway. Like, but walk us through what that actually means. Like, I don't think people, like, the people that we talk to, they, they don't seem to actually really understand the impact of what transparency actually means. What does that mean in, when it comes to, when it comes to living? From my point of view, it's the building block of trust. And to have any transaction that's not built on trust is a recipe um, for disaster or at, at the most just a one-off transaction. And what we're trying to do is create longevity, create renewals in leases. Um, what we're asking the consumer to do is um, hand over information. And information, when it involves intimate, you know, intimate um, uh, aspects of one's life, information can be used against you. And the, the trust building that has to occur 
And even this goes down to the heart of why we named our company Ollie. We wanted to, to humanize, anthropomorphize the experience. We want the idea is that Ollie is everybody's favorite neighbor, everybody's favorite roommate, the roommate that's picking up, um, you know, after the mess that was created or organizing the social events. We wanted to humanize that aspect for the consumer, for this transaction to be built on, on a foundation of trust. Um, because without that, that consumer is not going to be okay with that, you know, with that camera in the hallway or the, you know, listening device in the common space or the tracking and increasingly to be able to service the consumer in a cost effective, in in an effective way, but also a cost effective way. um, We need the consumer to be willing to transact with us on that basis with their volunteer, their information to us. So speaking of trust, Mark, you're actually going into their units. Like, like walk us through like the logistics of that. Like, what does that actually look like? Yeah, so for those of you who are are less familiar with Hello Alfred's service, uh, the core full service offering uh, from Hello Alfred is providing an Alfred to every unit of the building. And that's an individual who becomes the equivalent of of your butler, but we really don't like looking at at it that way. Uh, More like your trusted advisor for your home uh, with the end goal of making your home um, a place that is truly comfortable and convenient for you. So the four core services that an Alfred provides are a weekly tidy up. They go into your room uh, or into your apartment. They'll make your bed, they fold your clothes, they take out your trash, they do a surface cleaning, and they leave in about 30 minutes. Uh, They'll also pick up and do your dry cleaning and your laundry. They will also do your grocery delivery. And and in order to, and they'll also deliver your packages into the unit. Um, So to Chris's point, to Ash's point, in order to, for the consumer to get comfortable with an individual doing that on a weekly basis when you're not home, it's all about building trust. And we talk about it all the time. Uh, It takes a lot to get there. And it's why I think, building an organization in in the space that Hello Alfred did in the space that both the individuals here do uh, is such a challenge. Yeah, and it's been a unique experience for us as well on the hospitality side. So when we first started building out our automation platform, we started doing this about a year, year and a half ago, and this is where smart speakers were all the rage. So we started building out automations with Alexa where guests could ask Alexa certain questions and, you know, what's the what's their favorite restaurant to go to? Um, That was the idea. We were really excited about it. Turns out that uh, about 70% of guests that stayed at a unit that had an Alexa in the unit disconnected it. They just unplugged it. They were afraid of potentially being monitored. Uh, They didn't have trust in it. So we no longer offer that service. But the service that they do trust and uh, and believe in is we uh, utilize the last, we collect the last four digits of their phone number and that's the code that we set to be their access code into the property wherever they stay at a property that's managed by our platform, they have the same access code. And that only works from the minute their check-in is supposed to start to the minute checkout is. And that's been a huge uh, positive that we've seen uh, across the board because we created trust. We've had operators ask us to do cameras and automate cameras inside properties, and that's a big uh, no for us because it violates the trust and privacy. So, um, yeah. That's awesome. Um, I'm going to quickly switch the conversation here. Seeing that a few people here, actually a lot of people here are in tech. Um, we, in our world, we, we talk about scalability and, and, and the path to scalability. Um, when it comes to that, you guys all sit in different amazing seats from hospitalities to living to, to services. Uh, what is the perceived scalability of your industry? We see not the name drop or you know, kind of talk about a certain commercial co-working company that's trying maybe or maybe not trying to go public, joke. Um, what is, and if, if anyone read the S1, that was crazy, but, and um, uh, it was nuts. Let's talk about it. Um, <laughs> what is the perceived scalability um, in, in each of your verticals? Let me also start with you. Yeah, uh, I mean, in the hospitality space, uh, you know, Airbnb was our initial market, and the whole key of Airbnb is that you have unique spaces wherever you go. 
uh, and that makes scalability difficult because every house has uni unique characteristics to it. Uh, and the way we solved that problem was through uh, smart home and IoT devices that allow us to automate access, uh, energy consumption, and honestly, Wi-Fi monitoring. And what I mean by Wi-Fi monitoring, Wi-Fi is the number one amenity that travelers look for because who can work or stay anywhere with no Wi-Fi? So we monitor Wi-Fi in the sense of is it up and running? If it's not, we reset it, things of that nature. So it's just starting to create a standardization in uh, around those things. That was the first step for us. And now it's in the um, scalability through you know con uh, density within a building uh, to be able to do that at scale. Chris? Yeah, I think um, Ollie's own founding story speaks to what, you know, what the scalability challenges um, are with our industry, with co-living. Um, the fact that we had to take, my brother and I, when we started Ollie, we left our jobs in 2011. We thought we were off to the races because we had just obtained a Department of Buildings approval on how to densify a building code compliantly. Um, but it turns out, we had, so we had to take 400 meetings over the next three years just to get to our first yes. Um, and it turns out that, you know, then regulations were not the bottleneck um, for scaling. The bottleneck for scaling was the conservatism of the capital that are the gatekeepers to the housing, the multifamily housing industry. Um, that conservatism of the capital makes, creates aversion to change. Um, you know, people are, if you're investing in the multifamily, you know, apartment sector, you're, uh, particularly in these gateway markets, you're investing in the most conservative sector of real estate, the most, um, the least cyclical, most acyclical, um, and you're investing in a category that's got, you know, 95% plus occupancy rates. Um, and if you're a lender in this sector in particular, you're comparing your returns against government bond yields. Um, so risk aversion is what any, um, any tech platform or service platform in the multifamily space has to overcome. And that's about building trust, not with the consumer, but with the investor. And so we serve, I always think about Ollie, we serve two masters um, and I feel like we've really got our consumer product down um, but the longer, much longer process has been building trust with the investor community. And the reason why we took 400 meetings before we got our first yes, it's not because people were saying, you guys are, you know, this is a crazy idea, this will never work. Everyone was telling us, we want to do your second building. So we had to build, we had to build that trust. And the best way to build that trust is to find somebody who will pioneer with you, incentivize them to be that pioneer with you, and create that template um, that you can, that prototype and template that you can point to. You can't, it's, at least for, at least for Ollie, we had to do that. We couldn't just put an app out into the world and then iterate on that app. We needed to put an app into a building. And, a, and people and a program and a brand on a building in order to get our, our model out there. That building that we got our first yes on, that we left our jobs in 2011, got our first yes in 2014, it only opened up last year, 2018. So it's a long process, but the good news I think is that there's an inevitability to what all of us on the stage and other prop tech um, players are doing. There's a certain inevitability to the automation of the home and the hospital, um, uh, hospitality um, engagement and the community engagement in the home. There's an automate, there's an inevitability to all of this. So the end game is that you're disrupting the single biggest consumer product sector in the world, housing. And the question on scalability is not if, it's when, what is the timeline that this disruption is going to occur over? And that will dictate the IRRs for any venture group investing um, in this space. Mark? Yeah, I mean, I, I certainly agree with Chris that uh, the trends that we're following and the operations that we're putting in place have a certain inevitability to it. Um, and you can think of it, we, we think of it as the hotelification of residential real estate, bringing in those services, both the way you capture additional monetization, you monetize the resident or the consumer in ways that you traditionally uh, didn't before in real estate. Uh, but I think you can really look at scalability uh, based on where you sit in the marketplace. So in terms of owning assets, uh, your constraints there are capital, 
your constraints there are regulations, Department of Buildings, construction. How quickly can you develop? How quickly can you develop in markets where you don't have expertise? I think scalability there is the most difficult. Um, and you, I guess you can point to individuals like Stephen Ross that related in the incredible business that he's built and diversified beyond uh, traditional real estate. Uh, beneath that, you have property management. In property management, your scalability constraints are also regional, but they're also mostly human capital. For every new building that you, that you acquire to manage, you have to staff it up. And you're working in a very human capital intensive business uh, where you're maintaining the asset, leasing up the asset, and those are the scalability constraints there. Uh, below that, you have vendors and service providers. Hello Alfred, probably sitting above Bixby because Hello Alfred is also a human powered concierge business. So for every new market that Hello Alfred wants to open, they're currently in 15 markets growing from, having grown from four markets six months ago, they need to put an office in that market with area managers and then staff up a team of Alfreds who are actually the individuals providing the service in the unit. Also relatively human capital intensive. And then you have technology solutions like, like Bixby. And frankly, this transcends just the real estate industry. In any business, a SaaS-based platform will always inevitably be more scalable than one that is human capital intensive. You can almost think about Airbnb versus WeWork. Airbnb is a true two-sided marketplace SaaS platform. WeWork is actually managing assets. Probably the top line revenues in a WeWork type business will inevitably be much larger, but the gross profit and the margins will inevitably be much smaller. With Bixby, we grew in a three-year period to 3,000 properties and 300 units, but we did it on the back of a self-serve platform where anybody can sign up, regardless if you had one single family home or a 40,000 unit portfolio, and get up and running, potentially, arguably, without ever having to speak to anybody on our team, and we were able to do it with a team of 15 people. Now, at the same time, our product costs a dollar per unit per month versus Alfred's at $40 per unit per month versus the kind of contracts that these individuals are seeing. Uh, so I think it just depends which market you play in. Um, and at the end of the day, a contract with Chris's business is going to be much larger than one with Bixby, so we have to achieve scalability in, in, in order to build this, the same scale of business. Awesome. So I uh, want to kind of leave time for, for questions, um, people that might have some questions. Um, anybody have any questions? We did such an awesome job. Nobody has any questions. This is awesome. That's the first. <laughs> um, you got a question in the back? Just state your name, where you're from, and who the question's for, or is it just a general panel? So if ever hear that question, how do you get around the legal framework of Airbnbs in New York? Yeah. So I'll... Yeah. I'll take that. Thanks, Jack. Um, so the underpinning of Ali's business model, the pain point, the number one pain point that we're looking to solve is the affordability crisis. Um, and so our consumer, the, the big pain point is not that they don't, not that they need a new place to live every week or every month, but that they need an affordable place to live for the next 12 or 24 months. And that's what densification allows us to do. That said, because of the hotelification of our brand experience, the fact that you're coming into a furnished unit with Wi-Fi and cable set up for you with housekeeping, bed linen changes, towel changes, bath amenities getting topped up, toilet paper getting restocked. It's like living in a hotel. Um, and so because we've developed those organizational capabilities to manage that experience, we decided, hey, why not see if we can go the extra 10% of the way um, managing a front end process and a listing process, a check in process, the things that, and, and being able to manage a nightly stay, why don't we just go the rest of the way and actually create a shorter duration um, capability within Ollie? So we've done that as well. We launched that, we piloted it in our Pittsburgh location, and we call that strategy co lodging. So there's co living, longer duration stays, and co lodging, shorter duration stays. Not every market is going to allow us to operate our co-lodging model, but that's okay. It's not our brand promise to the consumer that they're gonna be able to have that option in every location. However, where it is super valuable to have that um, and where in markets that do allow for it, the typical turn on a unit when it vacates on a 12-month lease, it takes about one month to refill 
that unit. So it's this structural vacancy that's been created in the multifamily market. At Ollie, by adding the, the co-lodging capability and being able to shift that unit onto Airbnb until it relets for the next 12 month lease, we've been able to take that structural vacancy from 5% down to about a half a point. Um, and that's all incremental dollars that drops to the bottom line um, for the asset. New York, it's not just a function of zoning, but also if you're in a rent stabilized building and it's collecting a tax abatement, you're also subject to a six month minimum or sometimes 12 month minimum um, duration. And so some buildings, we just can't do it. Please state your name where you're from and who the question's for, please. Yeah, it's a great question. It probably comes down to like the potential recession or any future downturn. Uh, and will, will owners start to scale back what they're offering and will they need to? But I think it's probably actually more tied to the supply of buildings in a given area. And I think that we've built so much over the last three to 10 years uh, that uh, especially in class A luxury, where there's always gonna have to be buildings that, that look to differentiate. Um, they might change how they look to differentiate, I think five years ago, it was a, like a top class gym in the building. And I think now all class A buildings have a very nice gym in the building. So what's next? Is it a pool? Uh, I know a lot of people talk about building community. So companies like TF Living and Home who are uh, doing events in the building. Ollie. Ollie in, a di in certainly a different way as well. Um, so I don't think the amenities arm race is, is necessarily gonna change. Um, in the fact that people are gonna be looking to bring new services into the building and differentiate that building. And what I'm actually really excited for are like branded buildings, right? Buildings that are built for a specific community uh, or a specific person. Um, and everything in that building is, is geared towards that from the programming to the amenity space, uh, to the apartments themselves. I think we're gonna to start to see that a little bit more. And I wouldn't be surprised if, if companies like Ollie are the ones who are driving that because of the expertise that they've built in working with buildings at an operational level. Uh, so no, I, think, I think we're gonna be okay there. I think buildings are gonna keep getting better. Yeah, a couple things I'd add. So uh, as I mentioned before, we're based in Charlotte, North Carolina, and there's a boom of apartment buildings being built everywhere. Uh, it's a, you know, the city's growing amazingly. And there's startups in town with the sole focus of doing exactly what you mentioned. There's a startup in town that does provides uh, doggy daycare and dog walking uh, as an amenity. Another uh, does laundry, um, uh, pickup delivery. Uh, what we've also seen from some of the operators we work with is uh, them allowing their tenants to rent their spaces on Airbnb uh, for a percentage of, of, the, of the time that they're there. So usually around 25% of the time they're allowed to rent those spaces out as Airbnbs as another amenity. So it's, uh, it's really interesting. I think one of the dynamics that's really also um, interesting in building on Mark's comment as well is you think about the, the amenities as physical spaces and you think about the gym um, as being the most popular um, typically. I mean, we've seen about, we see about 20% engagement among our residents um, in the fitness center. Now that what percent come into the building thinking that they're gonna use it is probably a lot higher than 20%, but we see about 20% actually using it. Um, if we look at the community events that we organize, we see uh, our residents attending at least, um, we see 44, I think it's 44% of our residents attending at least one event per month. And so that makes the events that we organize by a factor of two X or more, um, it makes the events that we organize by far the most popular amenity. And the nice thing about events is we don't have to organize those and we don't limit it to the building itself. We can turn the entire neighborhood, the entire city, um, or even outside of the city. We do day trips to you know, organic farm tours, and um, we did a ski shoeing and a whiskey tasting, um, in that order. <laughs> um, but we do these events, and they seem to be far more popular than the um, even more costly um, amenity spaces that some of the, the buildings are creating for themselves. Do you think that due to the loneliness epidemic that 
urban cores are now starting to face, like in New York specifically, um, we, we've experienced that Google has been working really hard to address that with their staff. As cities become more and more urbanized, this whole loneliness, I, I think IKEA even did a study on this, on the loneliness epidemic. Do you think that's, people are, are naturally trying to find their place in the world through peer groups? And that's why it's leading to more of those amenities being served? Yeah, I guess there's, everyone. there's this company called Facebook that, that kind of <laughs> tried to address that. And so, yeah, I think there is a loneliness thing and people are looking for peer groups. It's, to yeah. it's super ironic, too, that we're, we're living in the most digitally connected um, time. And we're more urbanized as a society than we've ever been before. Um, and we're at, you know, amongst the lowest unemployment um, rates in history, which is also a... Um, uh, in, in, if you look at past suicide spikes, which is an indication of loneliness, um, you know, we've seen that spike in, uh, in higher unemployment periods, recessionary periods. So how is it that we're facing this loneliness e epidemic in, and su suicide epidemic really in, um, such a period? And, and I think that in a lot of ways, I do look at co-living as being an antidote to, um, to both of those trends. Um, I also <clears throat> think that it's that community is not one size fits all. Even though Ollie's focused on large scale communities, there's kind of sub communities within that. It's hard to have a close relationship with 400 plus people, which is how big our buildings are. Um, so one of the tools <clears throat> that we use is a uh, early on is a roommate matching platform. And there's a question on our roommate matching platform, which by the way is cheekily named Bedvetter. So Bedvetter asks the question. Um, what are your hobbies and your interests? And we haven't gone this next step yet, but it's on the roadmap for us, to Mark's point, to say, okay, you're a scuba diver. Uh, the person in unit 9B is also a scuba diver. Why don't we put the two of you together and be more of a suggestive, recommended um, social um, a kind of experiential platform as opposed to organ simply organizing or curating events on a more one-size-fits-all basis? That's great. Yeah, the only thing I'd add to that, I think we've also seen a significant increase in remote, the people working remote. Uh, so they're, you know, they don't have the community uh, at work, so they're looking for opportunities to get together, uh, whether, you know, through co-living or through co-working or co-anything. I think that's the opportunity here. Cool. We have uh, time for one more question. Um, any gentleman in the front, state your name, where you're from. Not like legit, like, really where you're from, but the company you're from. I, I, should, I should have specified. And your, and your social security. I'm kidding. <laughs> One of my biggest pet peeves is I'm a real estate guy, and I hate, one of the things I hate is when people like, like by definition, you know, first markets are New York and, and LA and Chicago. By definition, Atlanta would be a secondary market, but the economic boom we are seeing in Atlanta does not classify it as a secondary market. Same thing in Dallas, Nashville, Austin, Miami, major, er, and then throughout the entire U.S. Um, so I think to help answer to frame that question, I think we have to look at and contextualize that and, and say, where are we seeing massive economic growth and, ge and geographical growth in terms of population density? So to that. I'll just say that Ollie's second building that we opened was in Pittsburgh. And a lot of people told us we were nuts to go to Pittsburgh. It's for those who don't know, Pittsburgh is of the top 30 MSAs in the country. Pittsburgh is the second most affordable for housing. And, and I said earlier, the number one pain point we're addressing is the affordable housing crisis. Um, but regardless, at least I can speak to Ollie's model here, regardless of what market you're in, your rent check, if you're a renter or, or mortgage payment, if you're an owner, your, your housing cost is your number one biggest expense. And if you can 
provide value, if you can get that down, um, then there's, you know, that's a winning proposition to the consumer. So the consumer is ready for co-living in a lot of different markets. Um, I'll also add that co-living is not just about cost savings, it's also about the other three C's, convenience, comfort, and community, and those are universal. Um, so, you know, the consumer is seeking those regardless of whether they're in Pittsburgh, Atlanta, New York, San Francisco. The consumer wants convenience, comfort, and community. Yeah. And, and I'll just add that I think we both know value-add communities and properties can be some of the best for our business because we're a low-cost way to provide better service, whether that's on the IoT side of things or the operational efficiency side of things or providing service in the unit. So as long as rents can su sustain uh, these kinds of value-add renovations and putting products like ours into the building, then absolutely it might even be a better market, um, and especially in terms of the amenities arm race, which might top out in the large urban dense areas, you'll start to see that slide into suburban areas uh, and other markets like a Philadelphia or like a Cambridge versus a Boston. Yeah, and from a hospitality space as well. So we're based in Charlotte. It's a great market. One, the real estate is affordable. Two, there's lack of hospitality options from a hotel space, and there's limited regulatory issues there. Charlotte actually works with Airbnb and charges tourism tax, so it's a, it's a revenue generator for them. So we've seen most of our success in secondary markets, Charlotte, Atlanta, Jacksonville, uh, markets like that. Cool. Great. Done? Yeah. Done? We got to wrap it up? All right, we're done. I'm getting the cue. Got to go. Thank you. <laughs>